Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Boscombe Valley was mysterious, Shoscombe Place was old, and the lodge was hysterical, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Was Holmes more of a tea drinker or a coffee fancier? And what are all of the alcoholic drinks mentioned in the stories? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people have done for Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 323, Hobbies in the Canon. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you on your hobby horse right now? I'm deeply engaged in my hobbies. I'm inventorying my ball of string (laughs) and I've just counted out the first 41 meters of it. Superb, superb. So you don't measure in smoots, then? Oh, no, you can't measure in smoots. That's so 19th century. <laughs> you familiar with the smoot story? Uh, no, but I had a neighbor named Smoot once who kept uh, always kept coming by and borrowing string, and that's one of the reasons why I began to collect it. No, I well, don't. You, you should have measured smoot it in system. smoots. Uh, this is a, 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 a tale, and it's not apocryphal, it's actual, of uh, uh, Boston lore. There was a fraternity at MIT in uh, Cambridge, and I think, uh, if I recall correctly, MIT kept their fraternity houses on the Boston side of the Charles River, while the campus was on the Cambridge side. And connecting the two sides of the river is the, of course, famous uh, Massachusetts Avenue Bridge, or the Harvard Bridge. And the fraternity was uh, hazing pledges, as fraternities uh, often did in those days. And it was 1957, and there was a student by the name of Oliver Smoot. And the challenge was to measure the bridge in Smoots. And I think he was five foot seven. And <laughs> from what I understand, uh, rather than simply taking five foot seven measurements across the entire bridge they actually laid him end over end flipping him over uh about 300 times to cross the bridge and uh, if if you go to boston and you walk on foot across this bridge from massachusetts avenue on the boston side to cambridge you can see the smoot markings across the bridge and it is 357 smoots plus one ear I believe is the uh, official measurement. So, anyway, that it would have been easier to take the ball of string and measure smoots against the string than to simply take a smoot across the bridge. Well, now the story though is what became of smoot. I mean, with this fundamental contribution to geographic understanding, he must have gone on to a great career. You would think, uh, and, and as, a, as an MIT grad, he's probably uh, an engineer. Uh, Oliver you don't know R. that he graduated, though. Well, that's true. Uh, he was born in 1940, and he was, well, how appropriate. He was the chairman of the American National Standards Institute. Well, there you go. <laughs> no, what? no 
Talk Don't about nominative here. determinism. <laughs> Here's a guy who in college becomes fundamental to measuring the distance of a bridge and becomes chairman of the American stand. That's wonderful. That's but, absolutely wonderful. But he was unable to introduce a smoot as part of the measurements in the standards. So a little bit of a failure. There. Excuse me. It's 364.4 smoots plus one ear. Plus that's one that's ear. Uh, the Harvard Bridge length. So, oh, okay. and he was indeed five foot seven. I did remember that correctly. Well, that's great. So, and it was Lambda Chi Alpha, in case you're, you're wondering. We'll have a link to the Smoot story in the show notes, which you can find at ihose.co slash trifles323, all lowercase. It'll take you directly to the website, SherlockHolmesPodcast.com, to this particular episode. Of course, we also have uh, show notes in... Uh, whatever podcast app you happen to be listening to us on, we're available wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. That would be helpful to us. I hope other people find the show. And I uh, would love to have your feedback, which you can do there. Or, of course, you can just email us at trifles at ihearofsherlock.com. Always glad to hear from our listeners. And just a reminder, while we're on the subject, Patreon is available. You can listen to the shows without ads, if that is what you prefer, at uh, patreon.com slash trifles, or again, from from a uh, link in the show notes. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month to help us put out these scintillating programs. Well, we're going to talk about hobbies in this episode. You know, uh, the Sherlockian pastime is a hobby for many people. And um, there were a number of hobbies in the canon. And we come across them in, uh, well, a variety of different ways. So um, I'm kind of at a loss as to where we should begin this pursuit of hobbies. Maybe, maybe in the story that chronologically takes place uh, the earliest in the canon. Does that, does that sound like a plan to you, my friend? Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to follow your lead. <laughs> well, uh, recall in the Gloria Scott, Holmes was at university. He had been uh, bitten on the ankle by the bull terrier of uh, his friend Trevor, mm-hmm. Trevor Jr., and um, went out to recuperate. Uh, over the course of uh, a number of days at the Trevor estate. And uh, Holmes managed to impress Trevor Sr. with his abilities. And he said, I I don't know how you manage this, Mr. Holmes, but it seems to me that all the detectives of fact and of fancy will be children in your hands. That's your line of life, sir. And you may take the word of a man who has seen something of the world. And Holmes continues to tell the story to Watson, saying, And that recommendation, with the exaggerated estimate of my ability with which he prefaced it, was, if you will believe me, Watson, the very first thing which ever made me feel that a profession might be made out of what had been up to that time the merest hobby. At the moment, however, I was too much concerned at the sudden illness of my host to think of anything else. (laughs) This is a great place to start because it gets, in addition to going through the canon and looking at the appearance of hobbies and what it tells us about the cases and characters of Sherlock Holmes, this particular reference raises a question I never thought of before. But, but as you've just read, Holmes says, this is the first thing that ever made me feel that a profession might be made out of what at the time, had been the merest hobby. Now, we could certainly talk about, when we will, about hobbies and so on, but it's the first time I ever thought to myself, wait a second, until that time, what did he think he was doing? What did he think his <laughs> profession was going to be? I mean, did he, was, was he, did he think that he was going to be you know, an academic? Did he think he was going back to a family? I mean, what... It's a good question, and and he did say that he kind of, he he cobbled together uh, his studies. He he didn't go in for anything in particular. Yeah. Um, but to your point, uh, what it, it this is like dealing with my college age son. You know, doesn't know exactly what he wants to do. Right. Um, 
but, but this is part of the problem. It, 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 there may be nothing out there that fits exactly what he's good at, and he may have to create his own path forward. Well, the whole experience of being in university, it's not, it's usual, I think, for people who come to university or college and during the course of their education there and their time there, change their major, change their interests. They explore new fields they haven't dealt with in, in, in any detail. They get excited by other things. They have these sort of transformative experiences. There are people, you know, who are think they're always going to be a lawyer and go to law school and, and medical school and other professions that are perfectly happy. But it's not unusual at all for people to be to change direction because of their experience at college or university. Yeah. And, and in some cases, it doesn't have anything to do with the coursework, but it may be somebody that uh, like Trevor Sr. happens to push you in a particular direction as a as a mentor. And what a great plug for episode 314, Mentors in the Canon. I don't know if we actually talked about Trevor Sr. as a mentor, but um, if we didn't, then this is where we talk about it. So, <laughs> um, uh, how appropriate. But th this, this notion of uh, pursuing this as a hobby, this was something of a family effect because in the Greek interpreter, yeah. Uh, where we meet Mycroft. Well, talk a little bit about how Mycroft didn't really take this seriously either. Well, that's true. You know, uh, in this whole conversation in the Greek interpreter, where Watson has now learned of the existence of Holmes's brother, Holmes is now explaining in extraordinary detail for someone who's been very any conversation from Holmes about his family or his background uh, has been zero in, in Watson's experience. But now Holmes says, well, you know, I said he was my superior in observation and deduction. And if the art of the detective began and ended in an armchair, my brother would be the greatest one that ever lived. But he doesn't have any ambition. He has no energy. He, do, he will not even go out of the way to verify his own solution. Now, just stopping there for just a second, that really tells us a lot about Mycroft. What is it about someone who has these gifts, this, this high, highly developed ability to sort through and to, and, to, and to sense and to articulate accurate solutions, and then does not even bother to verify, to get the satisfaction of knowing, that, of confirming that they were right. Now, this probably also suggests ego because another, another um, explanation for that is you, he has such a certainty that he's accurate that he's just uninterested in, in getting anyone else's confirmation. But Holmes hmm. says, I've taken the problem to him, problems to him again and again. He... Afterwards, his solutions prove to be correct, and yet he doesn't have the ability to work out practical points, uh, which has to be go which must be gone into before a case can be presented to a judge or, or a jury. And then Watson, after all of that, says, "So this is not his profession." And Holmes says, "Oh no, no, no! <laughs> what what is to me a means of livelihood is to him the merest hobby of a dilettante." And then you find out he audits the figures in, in some government de department. So this is, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because that, that also connects to what Holmes told us in Gloria Scott when it was, it was at the time he was with the Trevors that this was a hobby. And it certainly appears that Mycroft also has the same hobby. But it's just stayed with him in that, in that role rather than driven him professionally yeah i mean perhaps if he spent a weekend at the trevors he could have uh, <laughs> been steered into something different but um but isn't it fascinating that um mycroft isn't really or wasn't really interested in seeing things through to their conclusion to see whether he was correct he was that either that um confident in his own abilities or simply that disinterested in that line of work um uh, and to me, that's almost like 
you know, playing Wordle with one guess. And I go, well, <laughs> I know what it is. I don't need to see if I'm right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, fascinating. Well, uh, let's continue on this thread of professional hobbies, because I think there's, uh, there's an interesting... A uh, few examples here where other professionals talk about their particular specialty, uh, but in terms of hobbies. The first is uh, Dr. Percy Trevelyan, whom we come across in The Resident Patient. Uh, he identifies himself, and Watson says, oh, aren't you the author of a, a monograph on nervous lesions? And... Uh, he said, oh, I, I so seldom hear of that work. I thought it was quite dead. Uh, you are yourself, I presume, a medical man. And Watson admits to being a retired army surgeon. And then Trevelyan says, my own hobby has always been nervous disease. I should wish to make it an absolute specialty. But, of course, a man must take what he can get at first. <laughs> It's interesting so, because here Trevelyan seems to be defining hobby uh, rather loosely as something I've always been interested in and that, yeah. I, that, I, that I like to do because I just find it very intriguing. And that is not necessarily a consistent, the consistent uh, definition of hobby that we see running through the canon. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And, and I think this comes up uh, again, in a professional sense, and in, in, uh, these other few examples, but um, it's it's almost a sub sub specialty, you know, something that is so narrowly defined, uh, and that someone has pursued to uh, as as in as much detail or with as much interest as they can, uh, and in fact, it, so obscure is it that it doesn't actually rise to the position of becoming a viable profession uh in other words if you wanted to become a specialist in nervous disease in those days at least uh, there wasn't enough uh, patient flow to make it uh, worthwhile at least unless you were uh well established already and could afford to have fewer patients mm. it so. is fascinating and you know from time to time in professions this pops up. I have a, a, an acquaintance of mine who's a very prominent uh, medical doctor in a particular field. And when I first met him, we were just talking about ourselves. And I said, uh, you know, explain that I was interested in Sherlock Holmes and that we did these podcasts. And he began talking to me about diet in 19th century England. And it turned out hmm. that he had this fascination with the history of diet and nutrition and knew an enormous amount about hmm. uh, 19th century England. And so here is a prominent you know, medical man who you might say, you know, his hobby has been and his and his area of interest has been, you know, this, uh, um, you know, particular aspect of uh, dietary life in Victorian England. Yeah, that is very, very peculiar. Well, but you um, find that in professions a lot. You know, you'll find people who uh, who are in communications, but they're very interested in working with the media, or they're very interested in speech writing, or they're very interested yeah. in employee communications. And... Yeah, and in some ways, uh, being a specialist in some areas uh, can be much more lucrative, um, or at least much more engaging for some people than being a generalist. Um, and, and what's interesting to me, in, at least from the professional sense, is watching uh, the cyclical nature of these interests. That, you know, a decade and a half ago, social media was the big thing, and that was my area of specialty. And now people are kind of backing off on that and looking for people that are more uh, broadly educated or broadly experienced to bring um, a, a deeper understanding to. Uh, particular businesses so uh, you see this over and over again um, as long as we're talking about disease that's a perfect opportunity to talk about another hobbyist culverton smith from the dying detective a well-known resident of sumatra uh, visiting london and uh, there was an outbreak of disease in his plantation and it was uh, not close to any uh, 
medical facility, so he studied it himself. And um, uh, Holmes tells Watson, if you could, uh, you know, go see him and convince him to come here, uh, give us the benefit of his unique experience of this disease, the investigation of which has been his dearest hobby. I cannot doubt that he could help me. One has to wonder exactly what he was, in, how he was investigating this in uh, in Sumatra. I mean, is he sitting there with his microscope slides and uh, his test tubes and his retorts and what sort of uh, information Culvert and Smith was compiling? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. And you know, shame on Watson for not saying, Holmes, isn't it an enormous coincidence that the very <laughs> man who studies this disease should be here in London? <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yes, you would think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and why don't you why don't you take us through our third professional instance of Doctor Mortimer in the Hound of the Baskervilles and his particular uh, interest? It's a wonderful example. The uh, you know Mortimer in this particular moment in the case of the Hound of the Baskervilles is astonished as Sherlock Holmes can identify the source of this newspaper clipping that's featured in this message to Sir Henry. And uh, Mortimer says, I, this is just astonishing. I could understand identifying that these words come from a newspaper, but that you should name it and that it came from the leading article, I think. How did, it's remarkable. And Holmes says, well, you, you know, doctor, I presume you could tell this skull from this type of a person being different from that of, say, you know, someone else. And, and Mortimer says, well, of course, of course I could do that. And Holmes says, well, how? And Mortimer says, oh, well, that's my special hobby because the differences are obvious. The supraorbital crest, the facial angle, the maxillary curve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Holmes says, well, this is my special hobby, and the differences are equally obvious. There's as much difference to my eyes between the leaded bourgeois type of a Times article and the slovenly print of an evening halfpenny paper, and so on. And that also gets us, you know, to this other question of what were Holmes's other hobbies, because the the amazing thing is, as you go through the the cases of the canon, you know, you find out um, that Holmes has almost a limitless assortment of things that he's really interested in. Why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we leave a cliffhanger here? Oh, right. And Good idea. come back to those right after this quick word from our sponsor. You know, one of Sherlock Holmes's hobbies was cliffhanging. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. You know, in the Baker Street Journal, we have so many disparate hobbies coming together. And whether they were Sherlock Holmes's hobbies or the hobbies of the contributors of the journal, it constantly and consistently produces some really fun and, quite frankly, some deep and thoughtful scholarship. I mean, uh, let, let's open the pages of the latest Baker Street Journal, just as examples. Anime. There's an article on Sherlock Holmes getting the anime treatment. Well, I guarantee you that a number of readers of the journal and contributors of the journal have anime as a hobby. Conan Doyle Takes Aim by Mark Alberstadt looks at firearms and shooting, uh, shooting ranges uh, and Conan Doyle and Rudyard Kipling's interest thereof. There are probably a number of firearm enthusiasts who are also Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts. It's amazing how these hobbies find an intersection. It is. And we've seen that all the time. Go back into the early days of the Irregulars and you find people like Banish Hoffman, who was a mathematician and a physicist who was associated with Albert Einstein. All sorts of people have been captivated by the world of Sherlock Holmes and have written works that have appeared in the Baker Street Journal. And you can make sure that you are part of these conversations and these thought starters by going to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and getting a subscription to the Baker Street Journal today. <laughs> 
Well, Bert, before you were so rudely interrupted by our sponsor, um, <laughs> you were going to talk about some of Holmes's hobbies. Well, yeah, I mean, cliffhanging. Now, there he is hanging off that cliff in Switzerland. But beyond that, in, in you know, we've just had this... Um, uh, example from the Hound of the Baskervilles where Holmes has acknowledged, well, this is my special hobby. Well, he seems to have a large number of them. In the Bruce Partington plans, we have Watson telling us about the about sort of the atmosphere of Baker Street and what Holmes has been doing in the last few days because, you know, the, the fog has settled over London. And so they're, they're sort of trapped in Baker Street for a while. The first day, Holmes was cross-indexing his book of references. But the second and third days, he had been patiently occupied upon a subject, which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. And then, of course, in other parts of the canon, we'll find out that he's in a university town investigating old English charters. He's in Cornwall investigating the roots of these languages. He seems to have an almost inexhaustible um, number of hobbies. And then um, I think it is in the... Um, the uh, oh, dear, where's my note here? It is, um, oh yeah, it's in the Red-Headed League where Holmes is looking at the order of houses and he says to Watson, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. There's another hobby. So he's always studying as, as, a, cab, as a cabbie might the, the layout and the organization of the city of London. And Fascinating. It, it's interesting that, you know, at least in the Red-Headed League, that hobby had a specific bearing on the case, right? He was able to kind of get a sense as to where things were with respect to each other in London. Um, however, in the Bruce Partington plans, as you note, that the, the, the two days, not just one day, but two of the four days that um, they were bored by lack of case and by the fog, home spent on music of the middle ages and i can't think of an instance when that might be applicable to something in his field it was truly a hobby oh boy now that's an interesting observation so that's it that is a case where well also you could say the same thing about i suppose the roots of the um of the language in the devil's foot case yes which yes would English charters now could apply to his to his professional work, but that is interesting. That is an example of something that might have no professional bearing at all. Just something that he's interested in. Yeah. Well, um, a couple of other. Uh, I, I think we should move now into the hobbies of uh, some of the antagonists in the canon. Mm. Um, I think the. <laughs> The uh, the one well we we I think we just mentioned this in oh the Haven Horror uh, over on I hear of Sherlock everywhere yes yes uh, Josiah Amberley and this is a very short uh, kind of a throwaway sentence but it was something that helped Holmes understand who he was up against um, and the sentence is it would appear that Josiah uh, excuse me it would appear that Amberley has one hobby in life and it is chess. And this alone kind of helps Holmes understand that he's dealing with someone who is uh, very strategic, uh, who has a scheming mind. Um, <laughs> un unfortunately, uh, Amberley missed, uh, well, who he would ultimately be up against, which is odd that he would go to and challenge Sherlock Holmes to help him solve this uh, case of his missing wife, uh, when he very uh, sloppily, <laughs> uh, showed Watson the tickets for the uh, the uh, performance that he said he and his wife attended, uh, and in fact, uh, those could be ascertained as to have been unoccupied during that evening's performance. So, um, not very strategic in the end, after all, this chess player, this chess hobbyist. Hmm. Well, that whole aspect of the motivations Amberley had in retaining Holmes in the first place is, 
is something that appropriately is not gone into in any detail in in, in that particular case because uh, you know it is it is perhaps a bit of a weakness but then Amberly was a weak character so there you are I like that I like that so um, but when you talk of... about other antagonists yeah. you know a good one is the Copper Beaches you know you've mm. got Jeff Jeffro Rucastle. And one of the things we learn about Rucastle, when when poor Violet Hunter is is on the premises at the Copper Beaches, she notices that part of the house is shut up, and uh, she's informed that uh, you know it's an area of the house that she's not to go into. And Rucastle says, "Well, it's uh, it's photography. That's one of my hobbies, and I've made my dark room up there." And, uh, you know, now, if Violet Hunter knew anything about photography, she would have said, well, wouldn't, don't you need a lot of running water? I mean, it must be very difficult for you to carry all those trays of chemistry up there to your dark room. I mean, wouldn't it be, you know. Yeah. But that and, was probably not, not in, her, in her mind. And, and by the way, while I'm looking around the house here, uh, where are all of your photographs? <laughs> you know, you would expect that if someone is a hobbyist in photography, that they would proudly display the fruits of their labor. Yeah. And that alone should have given the game away. Uh, or Rucastle should have been more careful about it and actually had photographs around the house. Um, or simply thought up his excuse a little more carefully. Uh, <laughs> but he seems to have been caught off guard in... Violet Hunter yes. being curious about that wing of the house. Yes, yes. Mm. Wow. Well, and the final example that uh, we should land on how appropriate this is. Um, one of my favorite examples of a mention of a hobby in the canon. Um, Holmes sent Watson to uh, visit, um, who was it? Um, oh, right. Uh, yes, this is the China... Yeah, in the illustrious client, right. uh, Baron, was he a Baron? Yeah, Gruner, Baron, Baron Gruner. Gruner. I almost yeah. said Von Bork, but that's last bow. Baron Gruner. Um, Watson uh, was uh, supplied with a, with a piece of, uh, or at least was, was shown to be uh, someone who uh, has in his possession uh, a piece of Chinese pottery, and he went to Gruner, who is ostensibly uh, the expert on mm. China, Chinese pottery, and um, he, he uh, Bruner questions, you know, well, who, who told you I was a connoisseur? And Watson says, well, I, I was aware that you had written a book on the subject. Yeah. Well, have Which you I read haven't it? read. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who would say no? So you should say yes. Yeah. And then, you know, and then get called out after that. But then he goes, oh, dear me, this becomes more difficult for me to understand. You're a connoisseur <laughs> and a collector with a very valuable piece in your collection, and yet you have never troubled to consult the one book which would have told you the real meaning and value of what you held. How do you explain that? Well, I'm a very busy man. I'm a doctor <laughs> in practice. And, and here uh, Gruner says the classic line. He says, that is no answer. If a man has a hobby... He follows it up, whatever his other pursuits may be. And you said in your note that you were a connoisseur. Mm. And isn't that, isn't that interesting that, you know, here, here we are spending hours each week talking with each other about our own hobby. Mm. And despite what other commitments we have, what other things may be pressing on, we find the time mm. for this every week. We, we follow it up, whatever our other pursuits may be. Yeah. Well, that's true. It's very true. Absolutely. It really, it's a wonderful example. And it's absolutely true. Hobbies become fascinating. They become central. They become important. They be, they're, they're things that we enjoy to the exclusion of other things. It's all about choices. Mm -hmm. And these choices are rarely a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> <laughs>
Photography is one of my hobbies. I've made my dark room up there. But what an observant young lady one has come upon. <laughs>